we will be um, answering the questions, some uh, some pre-made questions and uh, some of the live questions in um, Ask GraphQL hashtag on Twitter. So if you feel that you have any questions from the last uh, talks and you want to um, put the questions in there, that will also work. Um, Johannes is going to uh, to take to take the questions um, to Lee Byron. So be nice, don't be trolling. I mean, I know it's uh, it's it's hard to resist, but okay, I'll give it to you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I definitely want to encourage everybody to like pull up your phone and ask a question you have on on Twitter. So I've put this on the newest tweet settings, so I actually see your tweets. Um, so and I'm eager to to ask them. All right, but we also have a couple of questions prepared until you get up to speed. Um, cool. So uh, first of all, thanks for being here, Lee. That's really a yeah. pleasure. Should I introduce myself? Um, I think since nobody knows who you are, maybe that would be a great idea. I don't know. It's just always safe to introduce myself. Hi, my name is Lee Byron. I'm an engineer at Facebook, and I was one of the original few people that built GraphQL in 2012, uh, and then I was the main driver of pulling this thing into open source land. All right. Um, cool. So that that's fun, fantastic, and I'm really happy to, that you're here. Uh, so... I mean, we talked about GraphQL subscriptions today, which is one of the cool new features coming into the into GraphQL land. We have the RFC process. What are kind of like the next steps you'd like to see in the RFC process? Do you, do you want to funnel that more in from, from Facebook's end, or do you expect new cool ideas to come up and have it more as a community-driven yeah. effort? Um, so first I should say that what we really want to get in the end is a stable specification, a stable base. So what we don't want is something that's just constantly changing that people have to keep up with. We want to have something that can stand the test of time and be something that we can build on for the duration. In the same way that we're not like, oh, what's the newest cool feature that we're going to add to SQL next year? It's like, that, that thing works. It's awesome. We can all use it. We can use it for decades and still agree that it's just as awesome today as it was then. Um, that's my dream for GraphQL, but I know that it's n like it's early days. So uh, there's going to be missing pieces. There's going to be use cases we haven't thought about, and there's going to be all those corner cases that we need to tackle. So uh, real-time data is a really obvious one. So I'm super excited about subscriptions. I think it's probably going to be the the biggest change to GraphQL since we open sourced it, and probably one of the biggest changes even in the next like year or two. Um, but the other thing that's on my mind of like maybe the next big piece that could come is the ability to have a server that can stream the results to you over time rather than a more simple request response format. So something I've been thinking right. about. So that will um, add on like what you presented last year at React Europe, yeah. this defer and live and all of these. Yes, the exactly. defer and stream uh, proposal. is. I, I talked about it briefly um, last summer at, at React Europe conference. Uh, so something still floating in my mind. We want, I want right. to get that. So it's still an idea in your mind, or somewhere it lives in. So your we've code we've built prototypes of it at various scales, um, but not yet to the point where I would be comfortable recommending it at large. So actually, I should say that the we we want the RFC not to be the place for new ideas, but to be the place for good ideas, and we only know that they're good once we've tried them. So I would much rather somebody, so far, Facebook is the place where GraphQL is built at scale, but that's quickly changing. So that's actually going to be the thing that changes where these things come from. Um, but it, I, I want to make it a prerequisite. Anything that goes into the RFC or in, into the spec um, needs to be built at scale and prove that it can work. Um, and we have very much done that with subscriptions. We've been running subscriptions in production at Facebook for over two years now. And you know, with like stumbling in the beginning days and now we're pretty confident with what we have. And now that we've talked to the community about it and let them drive as well and realize we're coming to the same consensus, we feel really, really good about what we have. So I want that for all the next pieces as well. Right, right. So where do you see like the biggest lack of tools? Or So you, we have a lot of momentum in the client side space around GraphQL. Where do you see the biggest lack and the, the most opportunity really to have an impact in the GraphQL space? So I think there's huge opportunity for tools for native developers and tools for server-side developers. Um, I don't think it's an accident that the majority of the tools that we've seen have come from the JavaScript and the front-end community. That's partly 
our fault for introducing GraphQL uh, in the context of the React community. So we first open sourced it at React Conf and React Europe. Um, and so we've like started our nugget of the community there. And GraphQL is also a tool that we built for front end engineers. So it's no surprise that they're the ones who are most excited about it. Um, but as I spent years at Facebook doing stuff on the back end uh, with Adam and with a couple of other folks on our team. And I think GraphQL can actually have be like a huge unifying and cleansing force for back ends as well. Um, we just have to build the tools for people to do that and share them. So that's, that's super interesting since I also think GraphQL is not just for front end developers, but we're using it very heavily on like a server to server communication. So uh, does that Facebook do uh, does Facebook do that as well internally? No, we don't actually, um, and for a really good reason, I think. So I think of GraphQL superpower as allowing you to develop a client independently from a server over a long duration of time, and then utilize the network as best as possible, explicitly in the case of mobile networks. So the thing that GraphQL does really, really good is it lets you get as much data as possible over a single round trip. And when you're talking about latency, that's like hundreds of milliseconds, or sometimes whole seconds on really, really bad networks, uh, you really don't want to have to go back and get more. Um, but when we're talking about service to service communication, we're usually talking about speed of light between boxes that are in the same building, that where we've put like tons of, like, push the limits of physics to get the boxes to talk to each other faster, and it's not a big deal t for them to be chattier. Um, what you care about there is CPU overhead and memory overhead. So, um, like Adam's whole presentation was talking about as doing as much as we can to reduce that, but still, the way that you can reduce it even further is just write all your services in C and have them communicate with like raw memory buffers. Um, so that's roughly what we do. We use Thrift, um, which is a technology that was built maybe eight years ago, now, eight or nine years ago, at Facebook and open sourced. Um, similar to Pro Proto Buffers, there's uh, Captain Proto, there's a whole family of these things out there now that's an extremely memory and CPU efficient way to talk service to service. So that's what we do at Facebook for services. Right. So um, what, what he uh, mostly touched on is uh, code generation in, in GraphQL. And we also see, it who, who is familiar with the Apollo iOS client, uh, it heavily relies on code generations of interface, uh, of structs and so on. So um, what, if you, what if you're not a Facebook scale company and you cannot build all that infrastructure up front, how can you make use of code generation maybe for front end developers and so on? So um, does that even make sense? Oh, it, I think it totally does make sense. Um, I, we th sometimes think of GraphQL as a tool for building tools. And so the fact that you can use introspection on GraphQL and have your clients learn everything about how your GraphQL system works and then use that as a source of truth for building other kinds of things is itself a really, really powerful thing. So um, the natural follow-on from that is cogeneration. And in fact, uh, GraphQL's origins chart back to when we were rebuilding our iOS app um, to make a really high-quality newsfeed experience in 2012. And the engineers there were already experimenting with cogen. Um, and then there were some things that they were writing by hand. So actually, even before we were in GraphQL, we were trying to figure out how to take stuff people were writing by hand and cogenerate it so that we could make it faster. And then that provided a very easy in for GraphQL once we had that piece. Uh, but now every single piece of GraphQL at Facebook uses cogeneration in some way on the server side with the stuff that Adam talked about. Um, and all of our clients, iOS and Android, have heavily relied on it since day one. Uh, Relay, up until very recently, hasn't actually relied on it that much. However, we've been working on a new version of Relay for a long time um, that is heavily reliant on code generation now. So to your point, how can people leverage this stuff? One of the things that we've done with the new version of Relay is separate the pieces that are responsible for tying this stuff to React, separating the pieces that are responsible for running the stuff at runtime, and then separating the stuff that's responsible for doing code generation, such that each of those pieces could be reused if somebody found a cool way to reuse them. Right, so one of the, the goals, I think, for, for Relay, what you guys set for yourselves, is to maybe even decouple it from React. So is that something that will come? Yes. That's fantastic. Yes. Uh, although I should uh, caveat that we will not be the ones to go build it for other platforms. Right, Because right. it's something that's it's actually really important to us in our open yeah. source program is that we only open source the stuff that we use at Facebook um, because it aligns incentives really well and it means that 
when I go to work every day and I work on stuff, I know that I'm having impact for Facebook and I'm having impact to the community. And as soon as I kind of like split between the two, then I end up in a bad position and I don't do well by anyone. So um, my job is to make sure that these, and my team's job overall um, is to make sure that we, we do that in a way where we're kind of foreseeing how we imagine people might reuse this stuff and uh, all that is from Joe Savona, actually, uh, is a member on our team and was responsible for the architecture of this newer version of Relay, taking that feedback of, this is cool, I wish I could use this in even more places, but I can't. And he was like, oh, you totally should be able to do that. And so Joe is the brains behind this new version of Relay and really made it work so that it, it, you could recycle that piece. So that, that's a perfect segue to, uh, to the next question from the audience, actually. So when re will Relay 2 be released and will it solve all of our problems? Yes, it will solve all of your problems and everyone will get a free puppy. Um, no, there's there will be trade-offs involved. Um, some things will get easier, some things will get harder. Um, it won't break right under your feet when it comes out though. That's one thing that we've we've learned how to be good at from React is this uh, you know innovation in place where we can continue to move this thing forward without leaving people behind. So that's really important to us and that's part of why it's taken us so long from the early days, we were like, oh, what if we like started over? What would this look like? Okay, now that we know where we're going, we need to back it up and start from where we are and get there. Um, in terms of when people can start to use it, we're hoping really soon. So I think we're getting towards the very end of that process. So like definitely sometime this spring or summer, people will be able to use this stuff. Right. So what will be the, the biggest changes around this new version of Relay? And will it be Relay 2 or will it be... so what? So we're actually aiming to do Relay 1.0, just to like illustrate that this isn't really a new version of Relay as much as it is what we are thinking of as the modern way to build GraphQL clients. Um, and something that's actually been really cool is that the, the conversation around this new Relay, a, a lot of this has been happening within Facebook because we've been heads down building it and making sure that it works for Facebook products first. Um, but the conversations that we've been having about how to do that have been happening with the community. So uh, for example, we've had a lot of conversations with the Apollo group who work on Apollo client and some of the same optimizations and techniques and best practices that we're doing in the newer version of Relay is, are the same ones that the Apollo client are doing. That, that way we can make sure that these same best practices are spread out in as many places as we can possibly make them. Right, so uh, from my personal um, experience, I really, really like this idea of query co-location and so on. So I think that is hopefully a thing that won't change since that works perfectly. Yeah. I think one of the biggest hurdles for people getting into Relay and where there are also some limitations is around how mutations are structured, that you have like a really opinionated these, these configs. So I think um, a couple of months back there was a blog post around Relay and a new uh, store API and so on. And I think Apollo also just uh, released a blog post around their new uh, store mutation API and so on. So um, what are what are the design goals here? So will it still be as um, all magic included out of the box like, or more you can do everything you want? Yeah, so, so there's the trade-offs. Um, we explicitly want to remove magic, but the trade for that is that you have to supply what we were previously doing magically yourself. Um, so that has a lot of benefits. It means if you don't want the magic, it's not there, which means things are really fast. Um, the first version of Relay was very focused on building high quality desktop and high end mobile experiences. And we realized that over time, just using Relay at Facebook, that a really uh, excellent use for it was the mid to low range mobile experiences was a huge focus for us. and. Relay doing all this magic, which was an awesome development experience and worked excellently for building stuff on a higher end device, just it wasn't scaling down to the resources that we have on a low end device. So making sure that the core of the Relay runtime is really tiny, which leads to that code generation. So anything that you can get out of the core and you can put into code generation, save bytes. Um, making sure that we've like, we're tuning, you know, how many, instructions to the VM does it take to read stuff out of the store to make that as fast as possible because also typically on these devices you don't have a JIT like you're you're running in pure interpreter mode like IE6 mode JavaScript um, and so you have to you can't like use the whole oh V8 does this one weird quirk that makes it 10 times faster 
doesn't apply. Um, so we've had to do lots of really interesting things to make sure that it's actually optimized for the places that we want it to be optimized for. Right. So um, I think we, we had a discussion previously, will there actually be enough questions or not? So my page here is exploding. So we probably can like fill a couple of these sessions. <laughs> um, there are also a lot of questions around Relay. So I don't want to make the whole thing just about Relay. But one uh, question which also pops up for us quite frequently is um, how does offline work with GraphQL? And will this specific question is, uh, will Relay to assist with, uh, with offline capabilities? Um, out of the box, we haven't built that yet, no. Uh, it, it certainly is possible. All of the pieces we actually had were designing for that case in mind. Um, however, Facebook is something that you very often use in an online mode. Or when you're offline, it's not because you disconnected and you want to do something offline. It's because you're intermittent. Um, so there has been a lot of work to make sure that we're handling intermittent cases very well, but we're not in a pure offline mode very often. But it's built in a modular way such that it would be relatively straightforward to add that piece when the time comes. Right, that, that's great to hear. So going a bit more back into broader GraphQL land, um, so I think everybody has their, their favorite um, features about GraphQL and so on. And if you would need to like very concisely say, what do you think why GraphQL is, is so great? What are the things that make GraphQL great? Um, I'll narrow it down to two. All right. So the first one is, you write what you want, and you get exactly that. And then it never changes. So that promise is amazing. That means that we've been able to ship apps in 2012, so that was five years ago now, which sadly, some people still use those versions of our apps. Can't always get everyone to upgrade. They still work. Um, and they'll still work five years from now. Uh, so that's pretty amazing. And then the second is the introspection that I talked about, which is our like tool for building tools. That's been an incredibly important foundation. Although it's hard to so like, look, introspection, and they're like, what? And it's like, <laughs> and when we first added that feature to GraphQL in the early days, it took like a week or two for everyone on, on the team to wrap their heads around exactly what we were talking about. Um, but the the first one, you write this thing, you get that data, like people can just get it immediately, and so that's awesome. But uh, but I think especially the introspection that unlocks so so much potential for for different sort of tools. And so from, from my experience, what was really the aha moment for most people uh, getting into GraphQL was where tools like Graphical, where they can just like see your, your first point, but in a very visual. Yeah. And so we, I teach the GraphQL onboarding class at Facebook. And I usually do like a couple minutes where I explain the concepts and the basics. I'm like, all right, all right, let's just get to a demo. And I pop open Graphical. Let's type a query, and then within 30 seconds, I've typed something, and everyone knows exactly what's gonna show up on the other side, and they get it, and they're like, oh, this is really cool. And then I do like the mind blow trick where I'm like, all right, this tool that we're using is built with GraphQL. And then I like show them the query that it runs to make itself work, and then, yeah, then you see like brain matter coming out of yours. <laughs> <laughs> right, so going a bit more into, into um, backend land, so I think there are a lot of people who are excited about GraphQL and they are currently in a, in a company that already has a lot of infrastructure and they want to use, or want to just wrap GraphQL around that or maybe rebuild parts of the, of the infrastructure with GraphQL. So I think uh, Steven actually gave a great talk about this, how you can do this in several technologies. So what is your, is that still the, the best practice to create a, a wrapper around it, or what would you recommend people to to? So I was initially hesitant about this idea. So the idea is, you know, most people at their companies, um, they have, if not REST, some flavor of HTTP API, right? Like I hit this web endpoint, I get back usually JSON, unless your company is more than ten years old. Then maybe, God forbid, you're getting XML. Um, but like you got some flavor of that, uh, and one thing you can do is you can just write. A, a wrapper around that where rather than your the resolvers for all of those GraphQL fields on the types calling through to your databases, they're just calling, you know, whatever your language gives you, fetch or curl or, you know, go load that URL. Um, initially, I was not, I was like, okay, demo mode, fine. Uh, don't build this at scale. Just because I was kind of tainted by how we made things at Facebook and it's, ours is super integrated and, you know, 
folks like Adam have made this super, super fast. And it's like, that's what everyone should do is make a, a hyper-performant GraphQL server. So, but you know, a step on the way can be that. Until I started actually talking to people about what their architectures looked like, and I realized that for a lot of people who have subscribed to the microservices architecture, they're actually chatting with their various architectures with REST anyway. And so their like top level service is already a REST wrapper. And I was like, oh, OK, well, you're not going to get any slower than you are now, so you might as well just keep doing that. Uh, and so I actually think not only is it a good way to get started quickly, it might actually be the thing that is performance grade and totally reasonable for until you're like, OK, time to squeeze 3% more CPU win out of this thing so we can save money because we just build a data center. Like If you're not at that point yet, like wrap your rest endpoints will probably take you really, really far. And the best part about that is you, you might not have to ask for permission from anyone, at least to get the demo up. Um, you know, If you make something and then like throw it on Amazon serverless or whatever, uh, you can do that in a weekend. And I think that's pretty exciting. I think that's, that's the entire point that you like enable front-end developers who are able to write some, some JavaScript and therefore also Node scripts that they, if they want to use it, that they can just build it themselves, yeah. go to the manager and say like, hey, this is what I actually would want. Just don't accidentally become an ops engineer as a front end. Just, like that's a very dangerous step to make. Yeah, yeah I feel guilty there sometimes. Um, so uh, another really interesting question um, is, so how did the adoption of GraphQL spread inside of Facebook? So did you run around and say like, hey guys, stop doing what you're doing. GraphQL is, is amazing or? So it was heavily driven by the client teams. Um, so the seed was newsfeed, and um, that was strategic for a couple different reasons. One was it's like when you open up the Facebook app, you see newsfeed. So it was the most important thing. Um, but newsfeed is also connected to every other product. So if there's like an event happening on Facebook, you'll see it in newsfeed. And if there's a friend who just made another friend or someone who posted a photo it connects to friends, connects to photos. It, like Everything in the Facebook ecosystem somehow connects to Newsfeed. So we knew that if we started with Newsfeed, um, we would quickly kind of cover over a big majority of the Facebook data system. Um, and so we did that. We, we focused on only Newsfeed first, and then we shipped that, and it took us maybe two or three months to make that happen. Um, and then teams started fast following on. So the next team that we got was the profile team who wanted to convert profiles. Uh, and it was, again, driven by the client team. So the iOS team that was responsible for rebuilding Newsfeed was like raving about how great GraphQL was. And so the profile team was like, yeah, uh, that's way faster than what we have. And that looks way better to deal with. We want to do that. So that's how it started to spread. Um, and then we ended up in a role where for almost an entire year, we were kind of like API designers where... Uh, whenever we saw two people doing similar things or we saw a piece that we knew was going to be critical, um, it was just like a really common element, we would kind of jump in and make sure that we were making sound decisions that would last us at least a little while uh, before we regretted them uh, and then kind of let it kind of spin up from there. And now it's to the point where GraphQL is just like an, an obvious, one of the early boxes you check when you're building a new thing. Right, right. I think that touches on two really interesting points. Um, both are, are related to breaking changes. I think Facebook uh, is really proud about um, that their the whole schema didn't really it was just ad, um, adaptive changes so you didn't really have to say now we need to um, like get rid of all of these old clients yeah. but it was always somewhat backward compatible and the second question is uh, in this internal process when GraphQL wasn't released yet how many breaking changes did you have to GraphQL itself yeah. Uh, so, yes, we, we're still on version one of our API five years later, um, which I think is pretty crazy. It might be the longest lived V1 of, a, of an API. Um, although I, I've started caveating that with like, eh, maybe it's V2 because we redesigned the language. Um, but we didn't redesign the schema. So like the data system is still V1, but now the server needs to understand two different flavors of the GraphQL language. Um, but let's see. Yeah, so append only is super important. That's basically the reason why we've been able to do this. So you can't ever rename something that exists. Essentially, anything that would cause a field to get deleted because you either renamed it, or because you removed it, or because you changed the type and therefore made it different in some way, uh, we ban all of those. And um, that, that comes with trade-offs. That means like, oh no, I picked a, a name for this field that was like silly, uh, but it's a good name, and I want to use it for this other field for a totally different purpose. You're like, too bad. 
should have thought about that before you published it and then shipped iOS apps on top of it that we can never take back. Um, so that was an, more of an interesting cultural move than a technology move. Um, it meant that our company that was very used to moving fast, as long as it's 70% good, ship it, and then we'll fix it in production. Um, you have to kind of take a step back and think twice when you move forward with GraphQL. So every we made for an entire year, we made every single change to the GraphQL schema go through our team of three people where we, we could at least see it. And we were just, you know, I hated email after that, but um, we saw like every change that was happening. And we're like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. And they were like, oh yeah, you're right. That doesn't make any sense. So like, yeah, okay, stop and like breathe before you submit code that you can never take back. Um, but you know, it's not that big of a deal to uh, when there's a new type for something, you add a new field, you add a slightly different name. Um, and then when something no longer has hits to it, which happens eventually sometimes, a feature gets deprecated or turned off, um, and then the hits go down to zero, then we can go through and delete those things. Right, um, so I got a signal that this is the last question. Unfortunately, I have still a huge list. Um, should do this again but, sometime. Uh, yeah, we probably should. And we actually will um, at GraphQL Europe. Oh, yeah. So, wow. Um, <laughs> so uh, one question from me personally where I'm super excited about because this will make the, think the thinking process about GraphQL so much easier. Also the development cycles, how teams can talk to each other. Um, so I'm talking about the, the GraphQL IDL language. <laughs> So um, I think this is still somewhat vague. Um, there are more and more tools being built on top of it. So we, for example, shipped GraphQL up, where, which basically turns a GraphQL schema into a GraphQL endpoint. Um, there is GraphQL Faker, which does the same thing, but, but locally. So what are your expectations for, for GraphQL IDL, and how do you use that at Facebook? Uh, good question. So IDL stands for Interface Definition Language. It's the way that we can kind of visually describe a GraphQL schema uh, outside the context of any specific programming language. And um, it was kind of a late addition to GraphQL. It's actually still not officially part of GraphQL, as I'm sure you cautiously know. Um, but it's really, really close. And now that everyone is kind of using it anyway, we're like, oh no, well, I guess it's, we're going to end up pushing it all the way through. Um, it's probably 98% so what is in use is what we'll end up with, minor, minor tweaks, minor tweaks. Um, we use it at Facebook in a couple different ways. So one of them is how we actually get the schema from the server to the to the client. So we we fetch that with introspection, but then we turn that introspection back into a visual query. Um, that ends up being really nice because what we do is we we actually run a cron job where every hour uh, we pull the server to see if there have been any changes to the schema, and then we automatically create a diff, and then we check that into our client code base. And uh, before we just had this like opaque JSON blob and you had no clue what was going on and that thing would get merge conflicts all the time and it was a mess. Uh, but now that we're actually using the IDL, uh, you can go through and you can look at the commit history on that thing and then you can see like super cleanly what are the things that have changed. And then when something breaks in the app and you're trying to figure out what, what went on, you're like, oh, somebody added a field right here that doesn't make sense, it conflicts here, and now I can go figure out who did that. So um, that's probably one of the most important places that we use the IDL. All right, yeah, unfortunately that was uh, the last question, but uh, maybe you want to um, like take the last few few words of this meetup. And yeah, thanks so much, for, uh, Lee. Thank for you guys here. for putting this on. Well, there was, there was tons of content today. This is kind of a super meetup of uh, GraphQL. So I hope you are not overflow of information. If you have tomorrow, you come back to the meetup and think about any questions. I'm sure they are reachable. You can reach them and say, what was that that you say yesterday? And um, But thank you for coming. It was maybe a little bit different from other meetups, but I think it, it was worth it. There's still, I think there's still a few minutes we, we can hang around, isn't it? So if you want to hang out a little bit and maybe um, ask some other questions that were not able to be answered, uh, please do. Otherwise, I hope I see you uh, in other meetups in the future. Thank you. Thank you.